Welcome into the second week of our uh, Beyond Woke series on Sankofa. I am Dr. Charmaine Jackson. I am here uh, with our wonderful students who will um, be joining me. We will be having a nice conversation on the documentary 13th. Um, so last week, if you missed last week's um, webinar, we uh, introduced this concept of Sankofa and a number of students shared uh, what shared their Sankofas and what Sankofa means to me. Sankofa is a, um, a concept uh, to really kind of talk about and encapsulate uh, the idea of retrieving what has been lost. And so uh, it's a theme that's overshadowing all of our weeks of conversation um, over the six week webinar. And so uh, certainly do check out if you haven't already the YouTube, um, the YouTube <laughs> a video of last week's, right? So that's posted on the Hope channel um, as well as uh, other webinars that we've had um, with students and uh, other, other people. Um, all right, so uh, tonight we'll have two students uh, present, um, Simone, and DJ are going to talk about what Sankofa means to them. Um, we will be continuing that over the next couple of weeks. And then we will jump into our discussion of 13th uh, in Netflix documentary, um, which, which will follow on about that. So um, without me going on too much longer, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Simone. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Will someone let me know if you could see it once I share it, please? Absolutely, Simone. Thank you. Can you see it? Now we can, yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, this is my Sankofa presentation. My name is Simone, um, sociology major, education minor. And um, the very first definition that I discovered of Sankofa is it is not taboo to fetch what is at risk of being left behind. And this definition is really like interesting to unpack because it, like to me, it, it brings out this important, like heightened sense of awareness and also responsiveness because not only being aware of what has been left behind before, like throughout history, but how can we use that knowledge to evaluate what is at risk of being left behind right now in like all different situations. And so um, it just brings a lot of thought about awareness and responsiveness and just this overall commitment to unlearning and just generating new new knowledge, taking in new knowledge and just expansion. Okay, I'm gonna move into my next slide. Okay, this picture was painted by a close friend of mine who I grew up with for quite a while. She gifted it to me for my 20th birthday, which was about a year ago. And during that time, I was like coming to a really, um, a really personal like realization that if I wanted to be happy, healthy, safe in the future, I was going to have to completely cut contact with my parents and stay really close to my sister, who also was coming to this realization at the same time as me. And so the concept of Sankofa and just being aware of the past and being aware of history and just evaluating, you know, like what not only my past and things that have happened, but like things that have happened to my parents and like things that were left behind in my parents that I didn't want to be left behind in me to then like reproduce this same outcome. And so like me and my sister both knew we were just gonna have to just leave and just end it. And so um, in this picture, I just, I find this painting really beautiful and grounding and just full of thoughtfulness. And I see Sankofa in this painting because it brings us back to our roots. It brings us to an awareness and just great knowledge about other people's roots and places great value on mother nature, which is something I find really cool. And if you like something I always liked is that underneath the, the face, you can see that all the colors, all the colors that exist under the face also exist inside of the face. And so this is really representative to me of looking back and realizing that everything we're experiencing right now exists looking back and came from looking back. And so just the, this journey that I mentioned before that is this ongoing journey because it's it's a huge transition is just 
really just representative of Sankofa to me. And learning about Sankofa has helped me understand this process so much better. So yeah, that's my presentation. Thank you for listening. I'm gonna try to stop sharing my screen, but it's gonna take a second. Okay. Thank you, Simone. That was beautiful. I love that. Right, right. Mm -hmm. What's that? Wait, can you still see my screen? No. Mm -mm. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, comments, comments and feedback for Simone. Yeah, go ahead, Mira. I just really liked that presentation. It was like, I felt like it flowed really well. Also, that was like a really personal story. So like, thanks for sharing. You didn't have to. Um, the art was really beautiful. Like, um, I was just like, uh, really like taken in by it. I really like, like what you said about how all the colors that exist outside of the the person, like also exist inside the person and how like the things that we're, hap that we're dealing with now, like have happened before. Um, I just really like how it kind of looks like she's looking over, I don't know if it's a woman, like how they're like looking over their shoulder. I thought that was like really symbolic. I don't know, the art was really cool. And like the story was really cool. I feel like that was a really cool interpretation of Sankofa. I really liked your presentation. Thank you, Mira. Other comments? Yeah, Simone, um, I think it's interesting the way you talk about um, sort of your separation with your family um, and the way in which that also really kind of gives you a future, right? Because sometimes we think about it as retrieving something coming back, uh, bringing things back together. But in your Sankofa, really, it is about um, separating actually in order to create wholeness. So that that's really that's really inspiring, right? Like it's a different way to think about how um, how we can how we can maintain our wholeness. Sometimes, um, especially if we have toxic. I'm not, you know, I'm not jumping this onto your family, but you know, this is a kind of relationship pattern that can happen. We can have codependent relationships, toxic relationships with people, and sometimes our instinct is to constantly move in more, more, more. And in fact, the healthiest and the best thing we can do is separate, right, so that we can heal and. Um, and really find ourselves within a relationship and then take, you know, and then move forward together as individuals, right? But yet yeah, still part of a whole. So that's beautiful. And um, I've got a, a comment in the chat here. Let's see. Um, DJ says he liked the painting and Brie. Um, I feel like a piece I would, oh, it feels like a piece I would see in an art gal gallery. It so did. I mean, those, the green and the yellow and the blue. Um, very much in those kind of cool, but yet having that pop of yellow was very nice, like very, uh, uh, a bit of like, you know, kind of passion inside of that, those very cool emotions. Yeah. And then very earthy too, very much like Gaia-esque, you know, like a woman from the earth. It's beautiful. So thank you for sharing that, Simone. Did you have anything else you wanted to add? No, not really. Just thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for that story. Mira says, uh, I was going to say the blue and green felt like coming towards peace. It definitely does. Those, those cool colors, right? Have that kind of peace. But then that yellow that is like coming through in her eyes, right? Like it's the spirit in, within. Um, mm -hmm, yeah. I mean, that's that kind of calm space inside the, you know, well, the calm on the outside, but the fire that burns within, right? We don't always see but there is a fire within the, the light, right? The light that can shine within us. I love it. Um, all right, DJ, do you want to go ahead and share your Sankofa? Um, yeah, can you hear me all right? Yeah, we hear you. If you could just maybe, yep. Uh, yeah, I think I think it's okay. What, class, how are we doing on that? Yeah, I got this up. Can you guys see the presentation? Yes. So um, for St. Kelfa, for me, the first thing that I thought of when I uh, uh, when we were talking about it was not forgetting where I came from. And the picture says, the St. Kelfa bird reminds us that we must continue to move forward as we remember our past. And at the same time, we plant a seed for the future generations that come after us. So from this, um, 
the first thing that came to mind was something that my mother told me growing up all the time was uh, to not forget where I came from or uh, DJ, don't forget where you came from. Uh, always remember kind of like a humble beginnings type of situation. Never, um, I made it a, a, a thing to never have my nose up in the air. Remember uh, everything that I had to work for, but to also be appreciative of what I went through and to appreciate what I'm doing now. So, um, but how it applies to my life was to fully understand lost, I must first accept it. So I had uh, a really hard problem uh, with accepting the loss of my cousin, uh, uh, pictured in the pictures there. Uh, it was it's something that I'm still dealing with to this day, but uh, going through this class and hearing everyone else's personal stories and them opening up kind of makes it easier for me to talk about it. So in the first time that I presented this presentation, I. Uh, I feel like I kind of left it on a kind of grim or sad um, note, and I wanted to change that for this one. So uh, the one thing that I feel like he taught me or the, the, the thing that I'm getting from him, that energy that I'm feeling from him is to persevere. So uh, just not giving up, uh, putting my uh, pants leg on one leg at a time and doing what I love to do. That's coaching, being with my family. And in an odd way, I feel like uh, his passing kind of brought us together a little bit more. We make it a, a point to, to be together because you never know what will happen. So to conclude, just not forgetting where I came from was uh, my Sankofa. Thank you. Thank you, DJ. Um, that was a great presentation. Uh, I think I think what's very telling when you talk about the way you changed the, um, you know, sort of the way in which it ended, um, it may be indicative of your own healing and grief process, right? The way in which you're maybe moving through it. Um, when we have loss, um, you know, wherever we are, we are in that in that grieving process. But being able to um, maybe you've moved along, I guess is really what I'm saying. And you're able to, um, you know, see the, you know, the beauty of your cousin's life instead of focusing on the end of his life. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, comments for DJ. Go ahead, Mira. I, um, I just thought the family photos were really powerful. I always think family photos are really powerful, but like, I just really like seeing how all of you were like happy together. Um, also, thanks for sharing, because that's not always an easy story to share. So thank you. Yes, definitely. Thank you for that, Mira. Um, I think also interesting too is the childhood photos. Um, did you guys grow up together, DJ? Uh, yes, ma'am. Mm hmm Yeah. So that's a nice time to remember. I do like your word perseverance. Why was that the word you chose? Um, I had the biggest problem with uh, starting my life back up after. It was hard. I wanted to just stop. But I realized that me stopping isn't doing anything. It's not bringing him back. It's not helping anybody in any way. So just, that was the first thing. Persevere, you gotta keep going. Just keep swimming. That's right. One foot in front of the other. Well, I know that we're all very grateful that you're here, persevering. Thank you, DJ. I knew that word was significant. So I thought I would dig a little. <laughs> Um, let's see, I have a comment in the chat. Simone says, loved your presentation and the inclusion of the key message you got from him. It was really nice. DJ, you say thank you all. Yeah, thanks, DJ. All right, if there are no other comments uh, on the Sankofa presentations this evening, like I said, we'll, we'll do a couple of Sankofas before we get into um, our discussions. Um, but uh, we'll just jump on in. We're going to have this conversation about 13th, the uh, Netflix documentary. Um, 13th being about the 13th Amendment that, that ended uh, the enslavement 
of uh, Africans or black people in America. Um, no person should be in indentured servitude or however that language is specifically written in the um, constitution. Um, but this Netflix documentary really goes into this idea of how uh, the 13th amendment shifts, right? And slavery shifts from indentured servitude to incarceration or mass incar incarceration of black bodies, black people, as well as brown, black and brown individuals, right? Uh, and so this, this question and this discussion that goes on, um, sorry, I'm getting my notes out, in the documentary, uh, you know, going on with, uh, you, I think it opens up with this question of what gets inherited, right? Um, what sort of accumulated, um, what accumulated legacies are inherited and, and really looking at sort of this white black dichotomy that exists in American society, right? Um, and that being that dichotomy between the free and the slave. And so we set up this sort of polarized notion of citizen, not a citizen, the free and the slave. Um, so what does it mean to be white in America? It means to have inherited freedom right, to come out of a legacy of freedom and to be black in America is to inherit a legacy of slavery. And then of course we know we have a demographic that's not just white and black, um, but where do people kind of fit in, right? And where do they fall in on this paradigm? Um, because that is really it, that's the polarization. Are you gonna be in the free, the privileged or the disadvantaged? Uh, and enslaved. In this film, uh, this documentary went a little further than just to say disadvantaged, but really to say a new form, a continuation of um, slavery, uh, calling it a kind of loophole in the 13th Amendment, um, being that uh, no one could be um, kind of in this bondage except for criminals. And so therefore then we see black and criminality linked together. So that that allows, um, so criminality now takes on the place of the word slave, right? This sort of shift in ideological form. Um, at least that's the idea that gets put, um, advocated for in the film, right? Push forward. Uh, so I guess that leads to my first question, right? Well, before I get into that, um, the film goes further. Let me go a little bit more into a synopsis um, through different kinds of ways in which then like out of slavery, we move into Jim Crow, uh, the reaffirmation of whiteness through such um, at facets of media like uh, the film Birth of a Nation. Um, you know, there was this interesting discussion about looking at the concentration of Black communities in this country and where they show up, uh, particularly outside of the South, where um, there's this, this, you know, this sort of statement of Black people being like refugees in their own country. Like if we look at the concentration of where Black people live, um, to really understand that is to understand where, in fact, Black people could find freedom. Right, or at least to be free from lynching, um, lynching in that time, right? In the in the Jim Crow era, post um, Civil War, the Reconstruction period. Um, of course, we would say there's no place in this country where Black people aren't subjected to mass incarceration. Um, that's you know equal opportunity across across the nation, but that's a much more contemporary way in which um, between uh, the end of the Civil War and the Civil Rights Movement, we have the Jim Crow era with lynching being sort of the, the main way in which um, uh, uh, Black people are, are treated as less than human or enslaved or their lives are taken and stolen or put into uh, prison camps, work camps, this kind of thing. Um, under the name of being criminals, right? Black criminals and, and sort of this linking. Um, the documentary goes on to talk a lot about what happens post the post-civil rights era. Um, so then we have um, 
legislative changes that say separate but equal is not equal, right? The Brown v. Board of Education system, but then we get this sort of war on drugs and then drugs and blackness and criminality all get linked together. And so it's a new form, a new continuation. Uh, the Just Say No campaign of the Reagan era, a lot of discussion in the Nixon administration about, um, about the criminalization of uh, black communities in particular targeting um, black activism if and the film you know the documentary talks a bit about what's going on socially right there's this civil unrest we've come out of um, the 60s where we've got a lot of protests the civil rights movement we've moved out of world war ii um, we're enmeshed in some kinds of international conflicts the korea war the vietnam war uh, there's a lot of social unrest as well as we're dealing with coming up particularly in the the uh, 70s dealing with economic crisis right and uh, a depression that's going on at that time um which gives birth you know, sort of to Reaganomics in the 80s, uh, not dealing with social pro welfare program, like a, a disintegration of social welfare programs um, and kind of a, a reconcentration of wealth in the hands of, of the few with this idea of this trickle down economics and then the creation of uh, sort of division and targeting criminality and playing on the, I mean, essentially playing on fears of scarcity. Right. And then how blackness and race map on and provide the perfect um, kind of scapegoat that the government can utilize, that these different administrations can utilize to then advance and push certain kinds of political agendas um, to dismantle, at least the documentary talks about black activism in black communities um, and to increase um, fear around blackness. Uh, in, in addition, with the incorporation of middle class blacks into um, mainstream society, right? So just sort of uh, diluting the ability of sort of the black community to say, hey, we're marginalized. Nay, hey, look, we've got these um, very successful black people. What are you talking about? There's no like issues and then obscuring um, obscuring the economic inequalities that are going on, right? That we're continuing, we continue to deal with today, um, that we really see that shift happening about that time. At the same time, we see this um, criminal increase in mass incarceration, criminalization, the war on drugs. So the, the documentary is just kind of paralleling what's happened in society uh, and thinking about over you know, historical events um, and then how these things have become racialized to then fix blackness and criminality. Um, and then once that gets fixed, it becomes, it takes hold um, of mainstream Americans' imaginations and then uh, justifies sort of this, the, the mass incarceration system that we have, have today. Um, there is a discussion of the role that, you know, there's this corporation called ALEC, how lobbying corporations and government have now merged um, and so now we have the business of um, private prisons, as well as issues around immigration, um, detention facilities, and the inhumane treatments. And, and so the film is just is really going through how mass incarceration um, has really recreated a new form of slavery or just extended, extended the 13th Amendment or nullified the 13th Amendment, I should say. Essentially, that's why they call it 13th. All right, so that's it kind of in a synopsis. Um, we're gonna jump into discussion. I've got a bunch of questions in the chat I'm gonna go through. I've got a couple of comments of my own, but I'm just gonna go ahead and get going. If anyone has any comments as we move through, um, please do just go ahead and pop those into the chat. Um, I'm gonna start with Simone's comment. So um, Simone says, what are the implications of 13th, of the 13th uh, documentary being on Netflix, right? So this is a Netflix documentary when thinking about socialization. Um, so, right, so you're, you're really raising here, Simone, some questions around availability, 
like who has access? It's not like a PBS special. Um, do you want to um, speak a little bit about that question, Simone, what you were thinking about with just that part of the question? I see you have a second part and I'll get to the second question in just a moment. Yes, okay. Um, I figured that we could just do the other question like later, let other people go. But for the first question, I was thinking about how like this documentary is on Netflix and so many people have Netflix. So how does it, um, like how does it affect how people take in like truths? Because it's not like, like it's in a different format than a lot of other like literature and like written work and text on mass incarceration. So just how does that change the way that our definitions are like changing and evolving? And yeah. And then I, I did reference the social construction of reality, but then I didn't realize that we would have to have a whole conversation about like what that is and that it doesn't have to happen. So yeah, the taking in of truths, I think is what I was um, kind of focusing on here. So Simone, what are you, so talk to me a little bit more about what you're thinking about the social construction of reality. Tie that in real quick. Um, okay, it is like, I don't know if it's considered more of a model or a theory, but it's often, it's often laid out in this triangle. And we talk about like objectivation or yeah, objectivation, externalization, reification. And so reification is like the introduction of new truths and the goal is to make people internalize those truths so that they'll become socialization so such as like something that were a whole something that was like a process to make legal like an example is divorce so in order for that to happen new truth had to be introduced that there has to be another way to divorce partners other than to kill them because that was a thing so that truth had to be introduced. People had to internalize it. And now socialization, divorce is a thing and everyone knows about it. And that's like one of the most common examples when like learning about the social construction of reality. And after it is internalized and, you know, in the process it's being socialization, um, there's externalization. And then, or no, I'm sorry, after that is objectivation. And that's when like new laws and policies are created. And I actually skipped the very first one because I haven't like thought about the whole process in a long time, but the very first is externalization. And that's thinking about the issue and trying to figure out a way to define it and solve it. Does that- Thank you for Yes. Yeah, okay. thank you for that. I mean, I yeah. think that's really, um, it's an interesting way to think about it. I think it's overly rational, but um, mm -hmm. I certainly could see where, um, a more quantif quantitative sociologist <laughs> would be interested in that sort of rationality. And um, I, I think one of, the, you know, and I'm just going to get into the qualitative versus quantitative for just a moment. Um, because the truth is, divorce didn't happen from murder only. Certainly people met, married, decided they didn't like somebody and parted. Right. So if we're just looking at that objectively on paper, that's a nice, interesting story that like there was like the king maybe had to kill the wife to, you know, because of that. I mean, that's one sect of society, but, but in reality, people meet and separate it all the time. Right. Um, we do live in the world. We uh, so scientists may construct these models to try to think about how we kind of come up with concepts. But in truth, there is an internal truth that we all know we live in the world. Um, so your question was about, you know, this documentary, right? Like about how we, the production of truth and where truth lives and, and do we, do we take in information from some source like Netflix um, and believe it better. And I think really what's behind your question, and I could be totally wrong here, Simone. So please correct me, is how do you get people to understand reality different from what, what's happening? Is, is that essentially you want to change people's minds? And so what's the best way to do it? Is that the question? It can be. I kind of felt like it was more like a prompt that could go in like a lot of different directions. Like the grounding for me was the social construction of reality, but there was no like set question. It was just, where does this lie? Because it's like text, it's like film. So like, where does documentary fall into like the process of socialization? Like what truth? is- Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, but yeah, so I'll let your classmates go ahead, Mira. I see your hand going up. Oh, was that your hand or no? Am I just I um I was just gonna like look, I was gonna open up Netflix first. Like there's kind of like we've talked about this before, but like where minority issues are like special topic interests. So like the fact that it's on a service of like a paid subscription uh is like one thing. And then it's like you have the option to like choose not that education should be well. Anyways, like it's you have the option to watch this or not. And then like also I wanted to know where it was like categorized. Like it's not advertised on the main page. You know what I mean? So like I don't know. I feel like that's another aspect of availability. Like one, you have to have money to get to it, but also like it's only gonna show up on certain people's like not for you page, because that's not for this platform, but like you know what I mean? Like the algorithm is gonna work for certain people where it shows up, like you have to look for it otherwise. I can't remember where it is on Netflix, like on the home page, right? Right. And I mean, that gets to some structural questions, which is like a little bit different, but I think it's also kind of relevant because it's this question of truth. So the, the social construction of reality is, is embedded in, here's some social theory, right? You've got functionalism, conflict theory, and symbolic interactionism. How do we create, you know, why does society exist the way that it does? Um, and with, uh, you know, a very Marxist like this is to me, your question seems more Marxist. Although I, I get, I get the interactionist com component too, which is, um, how do we make sense of truth? Although if we're going in the interactionist direction, like the functionalist, I think is anyway. So I'm going too far, but um, the interactionist is like, how do we know? We know because we live in the world, right? We're constantly making sense of of reality and building it. The structural component is where is this located on Netflix? Who can buy Netflix? This isn't available um, just on YouTube. So, you know, we have it, you have to pay, you have to have access to it that way. Um, does the fact that it's on Netflix though and not mainstream media create um, greater access or ability to say different kinds of things? Do we in fact take uh, this, the veracity of this, the truth of this film, more serious than we would a, a tax, let's say, like the new Jim Crow, right? So that gets into questions of power, right? What forms of power of socialization? But of course, we know we're massively socialized through the media. Then the functionalist component, which is really what it kind of felt more like to me, was this question of, um, you know, how does this concept fit in reforming? the social structure itself. Um, so, so more of a functionalist approach there. So thank you on that. Um, go ahead, Mira. I uh, I don't know. I feel like, ma like Netflix is like, I mean, like there's like the paywall like issue, but I also feel like Netflix is like kind of popular. So it's like part of the mainstream. And I feel like part of the way we consume mainstream media is like, quick consumption for like entertainment almost I don't know maybe I'm like off base with that so like I'm also kind of curious how that like plays into how we look at the 13th any comments to that one while you all are thinking about that I'm going to go to the second part of the question here um oh go ahead Simone oh, I thought there was a second no that there is was not I, I put like two questions, but I'm also realizing it's 825 now. So I think maybe my second question can wait because. Okay. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Simone. All right. So we'll, we'll keep that question in there. I'm going to move along, uh, which is fine. It's fine to have that conversation. Um, DJ. This question ties though into this same discussion. And he says, do you believe that the media portrayals of black people play a role contribute to the criminalization of black people? So again, going to media representation. DJ, do you wanna say something about your question? Um, what I thought about first was uh, Trayvon Martin and how he was described by George Zimmerman. I know um, even, I don't wanna speak for anybody else, but even myself, uh, for a while, I refused to wear hoodies, didn't want to drink Arizonas, didn't even want to buy a pack of Skittles because uh, I, a black, a, a young black man in a hoodie with the Arizona is now being chased and killed. So um, me being of that description, it was 
even I kind of started believing that uh, I don't that you don't you never know what's going to happen basically yeah yeah uh Miara did you have your hand up no okay I guess I'm just seeing um but you did say uh in the chat, I stopped walking with my hands in my pockets and stores. I always keep my receipt in my bag, becoming super, becoming super hyper aware, right? Um, and why is that, Mira? Stereotype threat. Yeah. So you don't want to deal with the the headache of it. I don't know. It's kind of like a. I know like intersections of, of identity and all that, but like uh, uh, the same reason like I don't walk alone at night is not just because I'm a woman, but because I'm a black woman. So like, I'm also higher. There's like a very good chance I'll become a victim. There's also a very good chance that somebody thinks I'll make them a victim. So like, I guess there's like different parts of that in a way, but like, yeah, it's just like super hyper aware of my identity and what that means for other people around me that are like white or like that are men, stuff like that. Just like, uh, it's exhausting. <laughs> Basically, like, uh, yeah, like, I don't want to deal with that because it's it's a lot and it's really scary and it's real and it sucks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. DJ, you were going to say something and then Simone? Um, I was. It was just that even in Walmart, like, I get nervous every time I see those people checking receipts, just even though I know that I keep mine with me and that I'm not stealing a pack of gum. It's just like, I feel like I'm always... I think I've been stopped eight times out of 10. If I see 10 of those people, I'm being stopped eight times because I'm, well, in my head, it's because I'm me, but in their head, I don't, I can't speak them. You fit the profile of a criminal, right? I mean, that's the whole point of the documentary of 13th, linking blackness and criminality, you know, and how does that happen? And I think that was your question. Right? I think that's a question Simone has. It's the same question. How do we link these concepts together and how do we break apart that link? Right? Under what conditions does that happen? Is it through media? Um, and it's always interesting which Walmarts ask for the receipts, right? And who, who are they looking at? Um, Simone, go ahead. I was gonna, um, what was the, the, the question again? Um, I think he was asking about the role of media. DJ was asking about how media, does it contribute to the um, portrayals, media portrayals of black people play a role in contributing to the criminalization of black people. Did you want to respond to that or just wanted me to repeat? Oh, I think maybe just a repeat. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, no problem. <laughs> um, it was, yeah, that's good for now. Thanks. All right, Simone. Uh, in the chat, Mira says, I feel like this country was built starting with racism and classism. So combining them was like two birds with, an old, with one stone. Um, definitely the documentary goes through, right, the ways in which the history, historical legacy of racism the foundation of um, enslavement has carried through in um, thinking about uh, black labor, unpaid labor being responsible for the expansion of um, being important in the economy, period. Um, I've got additional comments. So there's, um, let's see, going back to the beginning here. Um, there are some questions about uh, our leadership, so I want to kind of switch over to leadership. I'm going to read um, a couple of questions. One is by uh, Tahia and one is by Tiara. Uh, or no, I think it was um, Tiara, yes. Okay, so both of them deal with um, our political figures. Um, well, actually, first I'll save Tihia's. I'll go to Tiara's because that one ties actually with a different one. Um, Tiara says, taking into consideration President Biden's recent claims of a need to, quote, fund the police while the past few years, the request of defund, quote, defund the police has been circulating. Can funding the police benefit 
future generations and end the cycle of mass incarceration in the near future. Certainly, we've seen that conversation around defund the police. I was not aware, though, um, of a need to fund the police. Are you all familiar with this, Tiara? It was in a recent meeting where he said, he literally quoted and said, um, the, the right thing to do isn't to defund the police, the right thing to do is fund the police. And I thought it was interesting considering we've been hearing the opposite the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. What was your thought on it? Um, immediately I thought, wow, like it would, that was it, just wow because I felt like he played this role to get voted into and now he's here, right? This is where you start to make changes. You're, you're in the position and then you say the opposite. It just kind of shows how politicians lie and play into roles and whatever people wanna hear and then switch. Yes, yes. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, it, it could, yeah, it's a, it's a question of like, how is politics playing into this? I think this also gets into uh, the question that Tahia poses, so I will actually bring that one. Considering how much profit many political figures earn from the prison system and mass incarceration, she's asking, is an apology enough to satisfy their action or should there be more uh, restoration? Um, and also, I mean, this does deal with this question of how are we going to address this, our system of mass incarceration? Um, why do we have the you know, world's largest population of incarcerated people and then they're disproportionately um, black and brown bodies in there, right? So are we really asking these kinds of, of questions um, about what we can do and what role do our politics, our politicians play in that? Um, and then seeing clearly this link between money and politics and incarceration, right? Go ahead, uh, Mira. I am. Um, we were talking about this in criminology the other day about when we got to labeling theory about like how uh, once you label somebody a criminal, that's how you create crime. Like, uh, like it's labeling theory is about how society at large reacts to somebody's deviance and the written laws we have that like determine levels of severity of deviance. So like when you write a law that says this act is illegal and you, a person does that, they become a criminal, crime has been created. And like it's cyclical on purpose in the United States to, in the United States to generate profit, which I think is the issue. And we got to another theory where like, it may be with like you invest in structural like change, that's where we address things that like motivate crime. Or like uh, if you take the emphasis off of punishing criminals for money, uh, we can kind of eliminate crime to begin with if we just like the social motivators that, not that all crime is done by people who like, I feel like there's an assumption that most crime is done by poor people and most crime is done by people of color. But like when you invest in like ties to community, things like that can decrease crime. When you invest in like resources for people that could decrease crime. And I feel like that's Kind of what people are getting at when they say defund the police if you invest in things that help people and deter them from like having this need to commit crime they're going to commit less crime yes and um, this ties a little bit into your question there mira um, in the chat which is uh where you really ask what steps can we take to go about cultural change that makes reintegrating incarcerated people back into the society successful and then decrease crime in the long run. Um, so there, you know, I think the conversation um, in the literature was, you know, about weed and seed programs. And so the idea was uh, when you dealt with crime in a community, uh, you wanted to weed out the criminals and then sort of seed in programs and policies um, that would help uh deal with right like future crime like the idea of like let's de-incentivize crime let's address the social problems of course what happens and this is sort of what the documentary talks about um is a reduction of funding for seeding programs um and just the weeding part right and so the seeding programs maybe being things like social welfare um community programs 
uh, increasing, you know, affordable housing, um, addressing, you know, sort of social emotional well being and all of those kinds of things. Um, and so then you just have this sort of funnel that's just pumping into the, you know, you know that you know why the ground is fertile <laughs> uh, in producing crime that we're not addressing it. And so this does tie back into this question Tiara says about funding police, but we know in the literature, it's the weed and seed. Where's, where is the seeding money? Maybe the conversation, we're so focused, we're so focused on law enforcement. Why aren't we focused more on social welfare? Why aren't we focused more on the causation of crime instead of on crime? So when we focus on crime, we get more of it, <laughs> right? Like that's our focus. Like let's build more prisons or let's fight about prisons or let's change the laws. Like what about the other component? Let's take care of communities. Let's ask ourselves, what are we doing um, to make sure children grow up in environments that are safe? What are we doing to help families? Not just the Just Say No campaign, Nancy Reagan was big about in the documentary, right? Just say no. Okay, does that get a child fed? Does that make sure a child's getting health care? Is that improving education? Is that making sure that child's parents have a job that's not a minimum wage, low wage worker, dead end, no future for your family job? Like, why is that the big thing that's going to save you? Just say no. Like, we're not dealing with people in communities. And then we go, we have mass incarceration. Like crazy. We've got a lot of comments here in the chat. Let me see what I've got. Um, let's see. So Tia says, the only way I could see where funding uh, would be a benefit is maybe having prison systems and police forces go through uh, bias elimination training or yearly psych evaluation is to reduce the discrimination. Yeah, I mean, that certainly could help. But again, like, right, like, let's, let's eliminate police. Let's actually eliminate police and not because we're going to just defund the police and not, again, do anything in the communities. The focus is on the wrong place, I would argue. The focus is in the wrong place. Um, Simone says, viewing defunding as a step towards abolishment of the policing prosecution system we currently have. Um, abolishment, but we have to put something in place, right? We have to lift people up. We have to build up our communities. We have to build up people's lives. We have to get in there and deal with people. We have to go in with very much a concerning, with care and concern and compassion, not the fist, okay? People have had enough of the fist. <laughs> I'm anti-fist. They need care. They need compassion, particularly in communities that have long-standing histories with violence. They don't need more fist. Um, go ahead, Mira. It was um, it was just what you said about like uh, like there needs to be a plan for like yes, absolutely abolish prison, but like there needs to be a plan to like get the people that were in prison like back into society. We were talking about this in criminology too, about how like in other cultures like Japan, where like shame is like a really big thing, where like uh, you have this strong connection to the community. And uh, you have a shame for what you did. So what's important is for like the, all the people that were affected by the crime and the person who like committed the crime all come together and like talk about what's best to uh, like, not necessarily a punishment, but like how to fix what was done wrong, how to make sure you don't do it again. And then like have everybody agree on what it takes to like come back as a community and like work together again. I feel like that's better than what we have now. Um, I don't know, just like keeping a person a criminal for money versus like, like what's the end game is just money for what we have now but like I feel like not everybody's gonna fit this because not everybody wants to like come back to the community but like not everybody who commits crime is are just bad people and I feel like those people we have to like do something because we, like, we all live here and I feel like it's I don't know a strong community and then like addressing what we all need and like fixing what was done wrong and making sure we don't do it again is I think it's 
ideal. It's, it's better than what we got right now. And we need to be a community. You know, the idea that we have the population that we do in, in Locked Up is, is really, it's not saying a whole lot for us. It's not. It's, uh, it's, pretty, it's a pretty weak solution. And um, it's, not, it's not reducing crime. And it's not reducing fear. Right, and I think fear is definitely at the heart of these policies. Go ahead, Mira. I just have a question. Um, culturally, how do you think we like get every, I don't know, how do we make cultural connection, not cultural connection, community connection strong? Like how do we rebuild that after like all the damage that has been done? Like between different groups of people, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's a great question. Do, do uh, before I answer, I would put that out there for the for the class. Like this feels so theoretical to me. Like like that objectively feels like the right answer, but like just there's a lot of like really bad history, and I don't even know if there's a way to right all the wrongs that have been done in this country. You know what I mean? I just. I don't know. This feels like utopian, the solution that I'm describing. I don't know how to like get there. Well, I can say if we don't try, we're just going to be stuck with what we've got or worse. Um, we're not happy with where we're at. Maybe part of the challenge is trying to right the wrongs. You can't undo what's been done. You may be able to heal the trauma. That may be more doable and to help people become whole so they can move on and live their lives. So that might be this, the way forward, I might think, is to think about how do we heal communities? I wouldn't say it's about the other. Again, I would say it's about the community that needs healing. Once a community is whole, um, it, conflict should dissolve. Conflict should dissolve because power has been restored in every community, right? So this power struggle should be reduced because we have power sharing happening, right? Like I'm not dependent on, um, I'm not the subordinate dependent on the dominant so that I can get healthcare. And the dominant knows you're dependent upon me. And so then I, therefore, because I have all of the power, I'm going to exploit you for that. You know, I kind of saw that playing itself out in the documentary. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit. I know there's a couple more questions I haven't gotten into. There were some questions, uh, particularly on dealing with gender, right? This gender dynamic wasn't really exposed. It was just mostly talking about masculinity, not dealing with issues of femininity. And I do think that's an important question. But I do want to bring up um, in this particular point, because it just jumps in there. Um, there's a lot of focus on the government, the government, the police, the government. But who is the government? We the people. Old white money. <laughs> we Isn't the, it like I'll say old white men with money? Like you could say it's money. old white men with money. Um, it is people who get elected. We do live in a democracy. We do have elections and we assume that they're fair. They may not be, but we're gonna assume that they're fair. <laughs> Okay, who runs for election? Yes, people with money. But we live in a democracy. So the people who are in power have been put in power by who? People. And the people are the one who keep them there. Because you turned your power over to them. Then you complain because you've given all your power to the government and the government is doing all this to me. No, you, we live in democracy. Well, I couldn't run for office. I don't have enough money. I don't know enough people. All right, well, maybe, maybe not. I don't know if that's true. I know that if you believe it to be true, it's true. I know we can see change anytime we're ready to. I know that social media opens the door for lots of things. And I know where someone does something, a politician, a government official does something that hits the news, it's the people that take that politician out. 
The power of the people is strong. And I felt like while we're complaining, right, it, the, the government becomes a scapegoat for our own relinquishing of our power. We need to take our power back. We have a society we're not happy with. Then why aren't we doing more about it? What does uh, one person in the film say? <sighs> Systems of oppression do this right under your nose. Somebody said this, uh, one of the speakers on the, in the documentary. Um, you know, while you're asleep at the wheel, they're running the system. Who are they? Why is this happening? This isn't happening. I'd argue none of this is happening under our nose. It's right in our face every day. We're aware. That's why this is called Beyond Woke. You know what's going on. What are you doing about it? Well, I don't know. I got to check my, uh, I got to watch that latest TikTok instead. Forward that on and fight about who hit who at the Oscars instead of figure out what's going on in your politics. Instead of standing up spending time figuring out how did my local representative vote when it came to issues that are, that are important for my community? What about those judges? Do you know who those judges are on the ballot when you go to vote? Or just vote across the line? And when they do something you wouldn't agree with, do you let other people know, hey, do you look at their voting records? It's all public record. It has to be. They're public officials. Mira. I um I was just curious, like what kind of advice you have for like things like voter suppression. Yeah. Okay. So I don't have any power. They suppress me. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, like, okay, um, make noise about it. Talk about it. Help get voters to the polls. Like voter suppression, let's talk real voter suppression. Like when people were being killed for trying to register people in this country. Nobody's being killed for doing that today. I haven't heard of anything lately. Is it something going on I don't know about? I don't watch TV too much. You guys could tell me. I know people die trying to get my ancestors on a ballot. That was voter suppression. I understand there are things happening, but we've set up the, the gates. We've participated, we've turned our power over. And we say, it's them, it's the government. The whole documentary laid it out. Yeah, there's a system. Systems are systems of people that need your participation. Your power needs to come back. It's not happening under your nose, it's happening right in your face. Right here. What are you doing with it? Well, you're busy pointing fingers or you're busy being scared. While laws get passed to treat people really poorly and you see it because it's happening widespread. You know, this goes to the initial comment about the social construction of reality. I know when you're in Walmart, DJ talked about his receipt in Walmart. We don't need no social construction of reality in front of our face. The people who are white are pushing their cart through with nobody bothering them, watching a black person be stopped and having someone humiliate them while they dig through their bags. That's in your face. You don't need a documentary to show you what's in your face every day. You're living it. And you're saying, oh, it's the government. Why didn't you stop and tell that security guard that's not okay? Why don't you go to that store manager, those in power and say, that's not okay? Why don't you go to your lawmakers and say, that's not okay? For those who can't say that's not okay. No, I don't have any power. That's something, that's them. Going beyond woke is to get conscious. 
to remember you can take your power back at any moment you decide to. These systems don't work. And in fact, I almost felt like when I was watching that documentary to have the, the dialogue, that back and forth nonsense. I thought of it as nonsense a little bit, honestly, a little bit critical. There was the woman, he was like, duh, 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 at the Alec guy, he was like, I'm corporate. I'm the corporate guy and I'm the, I'm the legal advocate and I'm the corporate guy and I'm the legal advocate. And literally the corporate guy was like, he was kind of in the right. It was like, he was almost saying, we don't want this stuff. We want what you want, but you're not holding us accountable. So we're going to do what we do. We're doing what we're supposed to do because you're not holding us accountable. If you are letting corporate America sit up there in the White House or in Congress and decide they're going to make laws together to benefit themselves and not the community, and you're watching this in front of your face, they're saying stop us because this is the system. The system has said you vote, you voted for these people, you see how these people vote, their voting record is public. You aren't stopping us and we're participating in the system as the system is designed. I mean, it literally was almost like he was saying, we're like, hold us accountable, but we're not doing that because we're saying it's you, it's you, it's you. I have no responsibility. It's all you doing this to me. I'm the victim, you're the oppressor. You have so much power to say, hey, you know what? We're not doing that anymore. That's not okay. It's not okay that some kids get to eat tonight and some kids go to bed hungry. It's not okay that my kid gets to go to the best school out there and other children, they aren't gonna to go to college. They're not gonna to go to school and that's not my problem because we got a fear-based scarcity mindset. There's not enough, there's not enough. And as long as we continue that and don't work together, there never will be, because it will constant be constant, constant, constant competition. Never collaboration, never cooperation. And it'll just be tug of war, tug of war. And the documentary did a good job of laying out what the problem is, but it really was a blame game. Everybody was blaming the government, the government. Who is the government? We the people. We the people. Oh, we need a revolutionary leader. Well, look in the mirror. Revolutionize your own life. Because if every single one of us did our part in our communities and our families and how we choose to shop, Oh, these corporations have all the power. They have to have consumers. Do you know how much money they spend on advertising? A lot. Why? Because you don't matter? Billions of dollars a year go into advertising to convince you what to do. And you don't think you have any power. Billions of dollars go into ad campaigns for elections. Voter suppression whatever it looks like happens because you don't have any power, you have a lot of power. That's the illusion. And you're busy blaming the system and the system saying, hold us accountable, hold us accountable, but you're not doing it. You see it in your face. You see who your neighbors are. You see what happens when you out shopping, who gets treated which way. You drive down the streets, you look over and see who's pulled over. You see who gets in what car with their children and what opportunities they have. You see it. What are you doing about it? Oh, it's the government. What, who is the government? Oh goodness, I've gone too long. You guys riled me up in that earlier conversation. <laughs> um, <laughs> I didn't mean to lecture We're on the webinar. <laughs> Um, but seriously, this documentary did kind of push a little bit of a button because it was all these people, it was very charged about telling you how there's a system that's oppressing you. There's a system that's oppressing you. Be afraid, be afraid. Don't be afraid. It's your system. It's your government. It's your country. It's you and your neighbors that you've been conditioned and taught to fear each other. 
for some political power that might end up in someone's pocket for five minutes until it changes hands, because it always does. And so we have a fear-based, fear-rampant society where everyone has a gun, everybody's living behind a wall, everybody's ready to pop off. That's no way to live. And we're looking for the scapegoat. Oh, it's the black criminal. Media paints it. There you go. There's your, and that's why it works because fear. That's why those laws can pass. That's why those administrations could come up with, I mean, they had all these documents and statements of people who said, yeah, we knew these were lies, but these lies would sell. Why? Because we, the people, bought it. Material conditions are real. There's real inequality in the world, but our fear is keeping us trapped in these systems. I don't know. I don't know, you guys, I've talked too long, <laughs> 57. Um, comments, questions, I'm gonna flip through what's in the chat. We have to take our power back, that's all I can say. You have more power than you know, go ahead, Mira. I mean, like, isn't there an argument that addressing how the government has like systemically accumulated and like conglomerated power and like kept it through like generations is like how we go about taking our power back by like, you know what I mean? I don't think it's like pointless. I think it's like an and both situation, like you would just say, you know what I mean? Oh, it's not pointless. I'm not saying the documentary has no value. I, I think the document documentary has a value of, of accounting for where we got to, but where do we yeah. go? From? No, not like the. You know what I mean? I just feel like talking about like the history of how power is like concentrated in the hands of a few is like how we go about undoing that concentration of power. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like understanding the history of how wealthy white men have controlled money, land, mm -hmm. uh, factions of people, property, things like that is how we go about like redistributing all of those things and becoming more equal. Like, I feel like we need to like blame the government because they did this. Like not saying we do nothing of undoing like all the things we internalize, but like it goes back to somewhere and like where it goes back to is where we like undo it. You know what I mean? I feel like, I, I feel like there's like merit in that. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Of course, Mira. I mean, there it, like, so what happens is that's part of the waking up. That's part of the consciousness to understand it's not you. First, you need to know it's not you. Like, wow, I'm working really hard. I don't understand why my ancestors just haven't been able to make it like you know, these other people, or you're, you know, in the privileged group, and I can't understand why the disadvantaged group can't just figure it out, right? So all that is to say, because it's been um, a very unfair game, right? Okay, so this is where we are. So that part is useful to say, oh, that's why. Now what? Now what? We want to stay in this spot, and I want to push. That's what I do as I push, <laughs> get out of that spot. I've been teaching for a while and I watch everybody stuck. Even the commentary stuck on fighting about, oh, or telling the story of where we are. Yep, great, good. Now what? Unfair game, yep, now what? They got more than you, they got less than you, now what? What are you gonna do with it? Ball's been handed to you, what are you gonna do with it? Keep talking about what's happened? Okay, we can read another story of another atrocity. Okay, now you know another way in which this happens. Okay, now what? At some point, you have to decide how you're gonna live your life. And either you're going to accept the past and let it continue to reproduce, or you're gonna claim what's been left behind, Sankofa, and move it forward. It's up to you. That's your power. That can feel scary, like, oh my gosh. But, but and you're not mopping the ocean, you're not. You're riding the waves. You're surfing the waves. All right. 
Um, we are at nine o'clock. I'm going to go ahead unless there's any final comments. Uh, I'm going to wind this out. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to push this, like claim your power and you guys push it back because we're going to keep having this conversation over the next few weeks. Um, next week, we are covering the uh, autobiography of Malcolm X. to see how the game gets played, what we can learn, how we can take our power back and go beyond woke. All right, you guys, anything else? Any final comments? Let me just triple check this chat. See if anything came in since, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Conversations about defunding police and all this. Yep, 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 yep. Focus on those communities. Focus on your power. There's a lot you can do. While you're focusing out there, you've forgotten all about what's happening right here. Put your energy back on yourself, back in your communities. Put your power back there. Because listen, I really heard those people in that, that man that was sitting there from, what was the name of that company? At least I heard that. That's what I heard when I heard him talking, Alec. He's just like, I just kept hearing him say, hold me accountable. Hold me accountable. You know? Otherwise we've given them a blank check and then we complain later, <laughs> they, they spend the whole check. <laughs> they drain the account. We gave me a blank check. I didn't think you'd spend that. Well, I did. You gave me a blank check. Next time, put in, put in some boundaries. Say no. You're not going to do that. We're not doing that. That's not okay. And I'm the people and I'm the government. We the people. Hmm. All right, you guys can chew on that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and end this webinar class hangout for just a second. Um, I will see you all next week for the webinar. Um, again, we'll discuss the autobiography of Malcolm X. And so have a good week, everyone out there.